if you have these things happen to you that are represented in the 10 aces, or people can expand that to 15 aces, you know, so you get, or add poverty and class and race uh, into those calculations. If you have too many of these bad things happen to you as a child, uh, your health outcomes in mental health and physical health are uh, greatly compromised. So your whole sense of well-being or the capacity for a sense of well-being is impacted by these early, these conditions in early childhood. So why would that be true? Why wouldn't kids just bounce back? <laughs> it's like, it's an absurd proposition in therapy. We know that people don't just bounce back from this, but it's a popular myth. And it may even be embedded somewhere in psychotherapy that people can bounce back. All they need is a chance to have insight and awareness about what's happened to them. And then they can have a breakthrough and they can understand it and then they won't feel the onslaught. But that uh, doesn't happen that way. We wish it would happen that way. That's the premise of talk therapy, or even behavior therapy, that people would just change the way they think, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, they have positive cognitions to feed positive feelings, or they have changed their behaviors in ways that really are about inhibiting negative behaviors or practicing positive behaviors that that will get to this core problem of fear in the human condition uh, that arises out of what I now call bad enough uh, parenting, which is a just a riff on Winnicott who said that we just, we need to have good enough mothering and we will be okay. So what's missing in that what well, had to be missing because there was no way to reach the, the very mechanisms in the brain that, that all of the systems that are now being identified, the way we think of as the amygdala or the PAG, polyvagal system, the amygdala hyperlinkage, that most of this is not known to therapists, that the, the brain has been deeply impacted by these events and has developed to serve, to be aware of threat, and to serve a threat response. So everything is filtered through threat because the early circumstances where the brain was being molded were threatening circumstances. Okay, so how do we take care of that? And the only way that I have found to get to these is this fear reactivity in traumatized people is through offering brainwave training, neurofeedback. And I would say that between 80 to 90% of people you know, that have used neurofeedback within psychotherapy, I'm not a big believer in, in neurofeedback outside of the therapeutic uh, relationship because I think what we're trying to do is to organize the capacity in this brain for relatedness, for being in relationships, because it is human relationships that make our lives human. It's human relationships that make our lives bearable. It's human relationships that even as an adult help to contain scary affect. It's not just as a child, but that's as adults as well. So neurofeedback and what I, what I call clinical neurofeedback is neurofeedback that is used within the frame of the therapy. And what it does is get to these innate reflexive fear responses uh, that were preferred by the brain early in childhood when there was no protection. And, you know, I don't think that in general, I don't think that therapists are trained to believe that they can change these things. They can just help people manage them. They, they can't change the underlying 
psychophysiology or, or neurophysiology of traumatized people, even if they have ever learned to think about the neurophysiology or the psychophysiology of trauma, they haven't learned what they can do to uh, address that. And that's, that's what these webinars are about. This webinar that you're going to have with Ruth Lanius or the series of webinars with Ruth Lanius because she's the person doing the most research in this. Well, the only reason to do neuroscience research as it's turning out is to show people what the impact is on the, the central nervous system of children under this level of threat and stress. And it is felt, I think, to many people that that is a permanent impact, that there's no way we can affect it. Neurofeedback is optimizing the plasticity in the brain. And plasticity can be negative. It can keep repeating the, the, the learning of threat or it can be positive where it, the brain learns to contain that and, and quiet that pulse of fear. Uh, and that's, that's the therapy for trauma. P Peter Levine, one of the most famous therapists <laughs> in the world, uh, has said to me that he feels that the uh, future of trauma therapy is in neurofeedback and somatic experiencing. What essentially, and I agree with that, and what, what essentially he's saying is that the, there are memory systems in the body that preserve the experience of trauma, and there are memory systems in the brain that preserve the experience of trauma so that you will avoid being killed in the future. It's absolutely about survival. And that treating the, those memory systems, which are interlinked, but seem also to be quite discreet, is the future of the field. So I am imploring therapists who work with trauma and care, and I know they care deeply about these patients who are suffering these repetitive experiences of terror, uh, fear, and dissociation to learn the neuroscience, but they can learn that in little bits, but learn how to, to do neurofeedback with their patients so that they can resolve these uh, underlying patterns and uh, that, that take over people's lives. I think that, you know, what I'm trying to talk about and teach about is that we get caught in uh, that trauma, traumatized people, and I think the people who think about traumatized people get caught in these loops that are generated by primarily by fear, but by experience of shame and rage. It's a hijacked nervous system, and it accounts for most of the trouble that we have. It accounts for most addictions. It accounts for most crimes. It, it accounts for most police brutality, it's fear. And how can we, as psychotherapists, begin to really understand it, number one, and number two, treat it? And I, at least now, I can't find another way to uh, do that other than to help people regulate their own brains lower their arousal, we know why they came by it, to lower their arousal and to learn the inherent property of self-regulation that sits in their brain that wasn't allowed them through the circumstances of their childhoods. Uh, it's all there is to do. I had a friend say to me once, uh, it was a friend who uh, was asked, why do you meditate? And she said, I don't know what else to do. And I'm at that place with neurofeedback. Say, why do I do use neurofeedback? Because I don't think there's anything else to do. 
Uh, so now's the time. You're stuck in your homes. Learn this. <laughs> Come to me. I'll talk to you.